Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. Very happy to be here with Jeannie Abrams, who's going to be talking about her book about the founding mothers, which I think is going to be fantastic and fabulous, really fascinating. But first, I just want to say a couple of things. One is I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs. I'd also like to welcome patrons from Tewksbury, who we are partnering with uh, this program on. So Ashlanders, Tewksburyans, anybody who happened to find us, we're happy that you're here. Um, you can buy Jeannie's books signed from uh, Aesop's Fables. I'll put a link to, uh, for them in the chat. So let's get started. First of all, Jeannie, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Jeannie Abrams is, I'm just gonna say really quickly, an author, a historian, and a professor at the University of Denver. Her book is called First Ladies of the Republic, because, you know, we hear about the guys all the time. We really needed to hear about the women. <laughs> and um, what I found really interesting about Jeannie is that she has um, a, an interest in a background and in an in, in insight into medical early medical um, history, early American history, and American Jewish history. And she actually often puts those three uh, interests of hers all together in her books and her articles. And she has some a really funny one called, um, let me just pull it up here. Uh, is it the spitting is dangerous, indecent, and against the law? I have to read that one. <laughs> Welcome, Jeannie. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Mina. And I really feel honored to join you all here today to share the story of the creation of the pivotal but often undervalued position of First Lady of the United States. As Mina mentioned, by training, I am both an historian and an archivist, but ever since I was a small child, um, libraries have been really a second home to me, so I'm very happy that this is sponsored by several libraries. And I also want to just take a brief second to thank Mina for her incredible patience as we got through some technological challenges, but um, we're here today, so that's the important part. Thank you, Mina. Yes. And before I go off screen for uh, Jeannie to uh, present, um, I just want to say you can put your questions in the Q&A, but Jeannie's going to talk for about 45 minutes and then um, we will take questions at the end. Put them in the Q&A. There's a button at the bottom of your screen for that. Um, I am going off screen, Jeannie. It's all you. Thank you. Thank you all. The creation of the United States after the American Revolution was, in essence, a grand experiment one which transformed the country from a colonial outpost to an independent nation. Abigail Adams later reflected on that historic transformation when she remarked to a friend in 1800, I have lived to witness changes such as I could never have imagined. My book, First Ladies of the Republic, examines one of those momentous changes the creation of the role of First Lady through the efforts of Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison. These three spirited first First Ladies, who in their time could not even vote or hold office, exercised intelligence and initiative to transcend boundaries between the private sphere of family and local community and the wider public arena of politics. The lives of these really three extraordinary women intersected on many occasions, and they learned from one another as the, new, the brand new position of First Lady evolved. And despite the constraints on even elite women in their day, rather than looking at the male and female socio-political roles of the era as a reflection of a binary divide, I believe it is more useful to view the way in which they operated together with their husbands and other relatives as members of a family unit. They each viewed themselves as full partners with their presidential husbands, albeit with different roles to play. And to varying degrees, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly all played a substantial part in the nation's early political life. Before we begin exploring the creation of the pioneering position of First Lady in more detail, I'd like to take just a few moments to step back and take a brief look at how heads of government conducted themselves in Europe at the time 
in contrast to what unfolded in the newly minted United States. The prologue to my book is only a few pages, but I'd like to read it to you to put the role of first lady and president for that matter in context. When George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States on August 30th, 1789, King George III and Queen Charlotte occupied the throne in Great Britain. For their official coronation at London's Westminster Abbey, just two weeks after their marriage, the English royal couple were decked out in elaborate costumes and the event followed intricate ceremonial rituals that had been developed over centuries. The coronation reflected the pomp, splendor, and opulence that had long characterized the investiture of European crowned heads of state, and it was witnessed by a crowd made up of members of British royalty and the aristocracy in resplendent dress. The new Queen Charlotte wore a lavishly decorated ermine-trimmed silver and gold embroidered gown, which was studded with diamonds, pearls as big as cherries, one person remarked, and other priceless gems. And on her head rested a circlet of gold adorned with jewels. The train of her dress was supported by a royal princess, and 16 barons held the canopy over her head. In contrast, Washington's wife Mar Martha was still in Virginia at their uh, Mount Vernon plantation home at the time of his far less ostentatious, um, uh, excuse me, far less ostentatious first term inauguration when he took the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall in New York City. It was witnessed by members of Congress, marked by the ringing of church bells, and then shared enthusiastically by a crowd of ordinary citizens who had, st who had stood respectfully outside the building. George wore a simple but well-made brown suit of American broadcloth woven at the Harvard Woolen Mill in Connecticut. The buttons on the suit featured carved eagles, the symbol of the fledgling republic. Washington's choice of dress was consciously made to reflect that he was a man of the people. And when they had wed over 30 years earlier in 1759 in a modest ceremony attended by family and friends at her home, Martha and George Washington entered into marriage by mutual consent without the need for outside official negotiations that had characterized all royal marriages. When Martha later joined the newly elected president during May 1789 in the young nation's first capital, which was New York City, she arrived in an elegantly simple gown sewn from material made in America rather than a fashionable European import. It was clearly a symbolic gesture made to convey the egalitarian underpinnings of the newly minted nation. As the Gazette, the local Federalist newspaper approvingly noted, Martha was clothed in the manufacture of our country. The glittering canopy at Queen Charlotte's coronation was sewn of cloth of gold, as it was called. As the original First Lady of the United States, as the position would later become known, Martha Washington had to create her new quasi-official role from whole cloth. Each of the three first ladies, by placing their own imprint upon the position, um, they did that. And at the same time, they learned from one another as they sought a path that would blend their roles as women, wives, mothers, and public figures. With no precedent to follow, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly began to develop the position of the president's spouse often consciously working to make it distinct from that of consorts in European courts and aligning it more closely with emerging Republican ideals for presidential behavior. As I mentioned before, it is probably more fruitful to look at the key players in the new American political order after the American Revolution 
as family cohorts rather than individuals. Certainly in the case of the Washingtons, the Adamses, and the Madisons, they operated more visibly as a partnership rather than a, a pure male-female divide. Martha, Abigail, and Dolly viewed themselves as wives of prominent leaders of the new American governing class with an important part to play. And they all three astutely understood that it was through their traditional domestic roles that they acquired access to the public sphere as members of the political social elite. The 31st ladies stood at the center of America's political world through their husbands. That was the reality of their time, but that does not mean that they didn't um, possess significant influence. When Martha Dandridge was born in Virginia in 1731, no one could have imagined that in little more than half a century, she would become, become known as Lady Washington, the wife of the first president of the United States, and a central figure in the momentous events that occurred during the Revolutionary War and the New Republic. At the time of Martha's birth, Virginia was a loyal American colony and the far-flung British Empire. English monarchs, monarchs of royal blood ascended to the throne through the long historical tradition of divine right, and commoners, even wealthy ones like the Washingtons, would no more have aspired to head countries than to have contemplated flying to the moon. Yet the revolution had politicized both American men and women. As John Adams observed many years later in 1807 to his friend, the writer Mercy Warren, was during the revolution, was not every fireside indeed a theater of politics in which he meant discussion, political discussion really permeated every home. The government of the United States was created on virtually a blank slate. As the fledgling nation's original first lady, Martha Washington would have to create the new role, albeit with strong direction, sometimes unwelcome, from the president and other members of his administration. And she certainly understood that her activities would serve as a precedent for her successors to follow. Martha undertook the position very reluctantly as she notoriously disliked being in the public eye, which she found constraining. Indeed, after she joined President Washington in New York, she once famously referred to herself as a state prisoner. But she proceeded thoughtfully and mindfully, carefully weighing her actions and taking pride in successfully fulfilling her responsibilities. And far from being apolitical, she soon became a very fervent Federalist and one of the New Republic's most faithful citizens. Just two years into her husband's first administration, she wrote a friend proudly that, quote, I think our country, the United States, affords everything that can give pleasure or satisfaction to a rational mind. Although Martha's contemporaries recognized the critical role she played in her husband's success, and she commanded great respect during her lifetime, especially among Washington's troops, who refer to her admiringly as Lady Washington, today the stereotypical portrait of Martha often portrays her as a charming but reticent woman and a faithful wife who stood loyally but somewhat meekly by Washington's side, attending to his personal needs and supervising mundane social events during the time he was viewed as the most famous revered, revered American of his era. Yet on many levels, Martha was central to Washington's political and military success. Born into a modestly prosperous planter family, Martha was raised from a young age to be a capable household manager, a responsible member of the larger community, and a congenial hostess who knew how to make guests feel comfortable. Martha's early training and life experience 
provided her with the skills to later succeed as America's founding first lady. Moreover, the wealth she had inherited through her first husband allowed George to realize many of his ambitious economic, social, and even political goals, such as acquiring more land and becoming a leading member of the colonial society, which ultimately led to his political prominence. It was Martha Washington and not the highly sociable and charming third first lady, Dolly Madison, as many people assume, who launched the first major event for what was called the Republican Court, as, as it came to be known, the Popular Drawing Room, which served as, served um, a political as well as a social purpose. Those occasions were guided by Martha and other elite women who lived alongside power and were drawn into the political sphere through their husbands, fathers, and brothers. For those early female members of America's governing elite, political life was a joint undertaking, an effort in which they participated actively as members of a close-knit family circle. The drawing rooms, levees, and dinners played a critical role in defining an appropriate style of manners for the new federal government, which helped it dis distinguish it from the old world royal courts. Although um, those American salons reflected some degree of protocol, including prescribed seating arrangements, they were far more open and fluid than their European counterparts. A good deal of political power brokering occurred at these events, including arrangements for strategic marriages. Probably influenced by a combination of her own personal preferences and her new friend, um, uh, Abigail Adams, as well as her desire to deflect criticism away from her husband, George, who increasingly came under attack from the Republican Party press for allegedly mimicking kingly uh, behavior, Martha Washington adopted a much more austere style than had been exhibited by European heads of state. It was one which attempted to reflect the dignity of those courts, melded with the new Republican ideals of individual liberty, which had fostered the new American nation. Elite women like Martha and Abigail, who had access to power in the early Republic, helped mold a new American ceremonial protocol. None of the three became policymakers, but they were still able to exercise considerable political influence. They mustered behind the scenes support for the president, their presidential husbands, sometimes exercised the power of um, patronage and facilitating political appointments for friends and family, and even lobbied politicians for support of causes they believed in. For example, Martha's appreciation for the sacrifices that the American soldiers had made during the revolution propelled her to make one of her few overt political gestures when she later asked Congress to provide benefits for war veterans. When Abigail later became the second first lady in 1797, she expanded the model created by Martha to support her husband John's administration. Um, Abigail had witnessed the British royal version and the French version actually firsthand when she was in England years earlier in 1785 when John Adams served as the first minister, first American minister to Great Britain. She had met both George III and Queen Charlotte at the court of St. James and had found the two monarchs civil but uninspiring and found England decidedly lacking in what she considered the superior American virtues of broader individual liberty and widespread prosperity. Moreover, Abigail had looked with disdain upon the drawn out intricate rituals that surrounded the London court, where visitors at the queen's drawing rooms often had to wait for hours before the royal couple briefly greeted guests. Abigail was, was, was a marvelous writer and so articulate and we're very fortunate that we have 
hundreds and hundreds of letters, both from John and Abigail to look at. And she very vividly described her first visit to the English court to her sister back in America, noting that after meeting the king, it was more than two hours after this before it came my turn to be presented to the queen. The circle was so large, the company was four hours standing. The manner in which they make their tour around the room is first the queen, the lady in waiting behind her holding up her train, next to her the princess royal, after her princess Augusta, and their lady in waiting behind them. The princes, princesses were elaborately both dressed in black and silver silk, while the queen was in purple and silver. Clearly through their dress, the royal family really exuded their privileged status. Later, as the wife of the second president of the United States, it is unsurprising that Abigail often consciously sought to distance herself um, and introduce her own more inclusive but far less opulent court style and to, and to really separate it from its European counterparts. America's first two first ladies, Martha and Abigail, both aspired to create persona that contrasted with a, a queenly one, but one which still reflected a dignified style that could command respect without either a crown or a throne. They each incorporated their own distinct ceremonial protocol at the events they hosted, which were largely um, aimed at decidedly elite participants. For example, at the Washington's drawing room, um, guests were formally presented, and these again quotes from Abigail, um, were formally presented first to the president and then to Martha, who was seated on a raised platform, but not a throne, um, before they were allowed to socialize. Ironically, although both the first two presidential couples intentionally set out to strike just the right balance between a more informal style and one that reflected the status and dignity of the new government and the authority of the brand new executive position, political detractors accuse them of trying to bring back monarchical practices that would threaten the fragile democratic republic by reducing the revolutionary era goals of broader liberty. Abigail chafed at any criticism of the Washington ceremonial style. She was a close friend of Martha's and an admirer, at, at least in the early years of George Washington. Um, and she insisted that all their protocol were mere innocent practices. It's important to note that first ladies and their presidential husbands were sometimes subject to vocal criticism, really as rancorous divisions deepened between the new political parties, the Federalists headed by Washington and Adams and the Jeffersonian Republicans, and not so much different from what we see today. Both Martha Washington and Abigail Adams served apprentices, apprenticeships, so to speak, before they came, became first ladies which provided the valuable experience that allowed them to play an important role in their husband's political lives. Martha became accustomed to interacting with people of rank. Abigail had served very adeptly as what's called a deputy husband when John was away in Philadelphia attending the Continental Congress and during the years um, he was stationed in Europe before she joined him, and that was about six years, a long time. She capably managed the family farm and finances, and she even developed a thriving business selling luxury goods from France. And later, her own stay in France and England broadened her world and deepened her appreciation for the American Republic. Abigail once carefully described to her sister her view of the key elements in American society, which she felt made it politically and socially superior to what she had encountered in France and England. Quote, when I reflect upon the advantages which the people possess in America, she observed, the ease with which property is obtained, 
the plenty which is so equally distributed, the personal liberty and security of life and property. I feel grateful to heaven who marked out my lot in that happy land. While in Europe, political subjects clearly commanded Abigail's attention. As her daughter Nabby reported, and uh, Nabby joined them in England, and also um, John Quincy was there for most of the time uh, she was in England. Nabby reported, during their social calls in London, Abigail proved a lively conversationalist who relished what Nabby called her dish of politics. From the very earliest days of her marriage, Abigail was part of a political household. Abigail also was exposed to scientific lectures in London. Education for women was an area that had been long important to Abigail, and she took the opportunity to praise the superior education of elite women in England, one of the few aspects of European culture she admired. She commented after going to these lectures that her exposure to scientific subjects there was, quote, like going into a beautiful country which I never saw before, a country which our American females are not um, permitted to visit or inspect. In my examination of the three first ladies of the United States as a group, I found that their lives intersected on numerous occasions and that they influenced one another during the nation's formative years, either directly or indirectly. Indeed, shortly before Abigail stepped into the role of presidential wife and first lady, she wrote to, quote, her most amiable predecessor, Martha, for advice and guidance. From the moment that Abigail met Mrs. Washington, she was drawn to Martha's natural dignity and elegant simplicity as well as her warm personality. And she found the new first lady far superior to the snobbish queen she had encountered in England. After Martha and Abigail first met in June 1789 in New York City, Abigail reported to her sister Mary that, quote, I took the earliest opportunity to go and pay my respects to Mrs. Washington. She received me with great ease and politeness. She is plain in her dress, but the plainness is the best of every article. Her manners are modest and unassuming, dignified and feminine, not the tincture of hauteur about her. Abigail not only admired Martha, but looked to her as a role model. In early 1797, as Abigail prepared to assume the first ladyship after John's election as the second president of the United States, she wrote a letter to Martha in which she insisted she would have far preferred that Martha had remained in the position. Abigail insisted that the former first lady's conduct had reflected, quote, so exemplary a character as irreproachable while it cannot fail to, an, uh, to excite an emulation in the bosom of your successor. She then implored Martha to give her advice and to communicate to me those rules which you prescribed and practiced. Obviously, Abigail was concerned about following proper social and political protocol, an area in which she felt Martha had blazed a trail. Abigail certainly understood the importance of her new position as First Lady for bolstering support for her husband, John, deflecting criticism, and the central role social interactions played in developing the new political culture of the new republic. She clearly recognized that the president's wife had the unofficial power to help build or sabotage vital political alliances. In the Republic, the relations between the emerging Federalist and Republican parties were as fractious as our politics today. Abigail Adams was undoubtedly the most intellectual of the first three ladies. One early political commentator maintained that, quote, Abigail Adams was unquestionably the most brilliant conversationalist among the ladies of her day and an extremely intelligent and fascinating woman. She possessed a deep grasp of political theory, 
And John Adams, who realized his wife was an exceptional woman, often used her as a political sounding board. He often discussed political theories with her and enlisted her feedback with drafts of his speeches. Soon after he was elected president, John wrote her and declared dramatically, I never wanted your advice and assistance more in my life. Abigail kept a finger on the pulse of the leading newspapers of her day and provided corrections, as she called them, when she felt editors had erred in their reporting or opinions. As First Lady, she was often interviewed um, in the press and thereby really influenced public opinion. She was especially sensitive about any editorial criticism of her husband during his presidency. That led her to urge John to support the um, really ill-fated Alien and Sedition Acts, which played a role in his defeat for a second term. It may also reflect the first instance that a first lady had influence, actual influence on legislation. If Martha Washington launched the first American political salon, Abigail transformed it into an intellectual hub in which she participated fully and, and could hold her own in the most important political conversations of the day. In 1790, the nation's capital was moved temporarily to Philadelphia for an agreed upon 10 year period. At that time, future First Lady Dolly Madison was married to her first husband, John Todd. Dolly was certainly aware of the public efforts undertaken by Martha and Abigail when they each resided in Philadelphia during their husband's terms in office. Dolly lived in the city during Washington's presidency, and she became personally involved in the political life of Philadelphia after her second marriage to Congressman James Madison in 1794. James later served as Secretary of State under Madison, excuse me, under uh, President Thomas Jefferson. It was during that time that Dolly actively began building her own robust public social and political power base at the welcoming Madison home in the nation's permanent capital of Washington. And at times, she had served as Jefferson's unofficial hostess, gaining experience for her later role as First Lady. Clearly, Dolly appreciated Martha's and Abigail's earlier efforts to shape their respective courts um, through their hosting of events, for all three understood the power of those social occasions to inform public manners and to display their husband's presidential characters and agendas in the best possible light, thereby even influencing the direction of politics. Although on one level social events served as entertainment, they were from fundamentally political, political in a practical manner, for many alliances between politicians were built at those events. The events also helped to smooth over regional and personal fissures in an informal manner, and drawing rooms also afforded politicians a platform in which to test their ideas. Yet Dolly undoubtedly found her predecessor's events to have been overly formal and much too limited in reach. In 1809, after Madison was elected president, Dolly adopted her far more accessible and flamboyant style as first lady, even welcoming the sobriquet of Queen Dolly, as she was dubbed, a title both Abigail and Martha would have disdained. Some prominent Washingtonians like Benjamin Latrobe, Dolly's friend and the architect who helped design the new White House, were not always pleased with the result of her more open entertainment approach. Although Latrobe observed in his memoirs that her first drawing room as first lady drew a crowd of what he quoted, what he called respectable people, by the third round, he lamented, it was attracting a perfect rabble in beards and boots, common people, and he was quite an elitist. It is important to note that Dolly Madison did not create her public persona as First Lady in a vacuum. She built her enlarged presence um, as what um, some termed a Republican queen 
on the foundations that Martha and Abigail had initiated. Dolly retained some of their practices, such as the popular drawing rooms, and discarded others such as remaining seated to be greeted by visitors, for Dolly mingled freely with guests instead. And uh, Dolly was very tall and statuesque, and she could be seen all over um, the salon or the drawing room. She found the latter useful in her concerted campaign to build unity in a young republic which had not yet developed a path for working with fragmented competing political interests and parties. Dowley did not originate the idea or the position of first, first lady, nor as some writers have suggested, introduced the popular custom of hosting drawing rooms or even serving ice cream at these highly crowded squeezes as they were nicknamed. However, Dowley went on to enthusiastically expand the position of first lady in a manner that was once more visible, intentional, and more democratic than her predecessors. Despite some public criticism, it was a role which ultimately her earned her the admiration of many of her contemporaries and future generations as one of the most popular and acclaimed of the nation's first ladies. Mrs. Madison moved well beyond cultivating merely a select group of the nation's early elite to include male and female guests from virtually all classes at her social gatherings, although everyone realized that most of the real power was in the hands of the governing elite. Her efforts not only aided in prompting national unity in a highly contentious political environment, but also helped move the United States forward as a budding democratic republic. Like Martha and Abigail before her, um, Dolly served as a model for what was called a Republican wife. But at the same time, she was able to use that image to her advantage to support James's political goals. Dolly was known for her fondness for fashionable French styles, both in furnishings and dress, but she was able even to use that tradi traditionally um, feminine era of interest, area of interest purposely to foster a unique American consciousness. As one historian noted, Mrs. Madison interpreted European dress, manners, and food through a purely American filter, an approach which melded the Federalist desire for high style and the Republican emphasis on simplicity. During the entire eight years of her husband's tenure, Dowley managed to combine a regal presence with a spirit of social inclusivity and accessibility. Dowley's influence was recognized not only by contemporary female society figures, such as one friend who pronounced Dowley, quote, peculiarly, peculiarly fitted to the station of first lady, but also by the prominent male politicians of her time. Future President John Quincy Adams, um, son of Abigail and John, and then a senator from Massachusetts, observed that Dolly had been overtly involved in political electioneering on behalf of her husband. Senator Mitchell of New York, one of the emo uh, really most astute political observers of his day, dubbed her the Queen of Hearts and noted Dolly's impact on the election against his rival, Federalist uh, candidate Charles Pink Pinckney. Mitchell declared, Mitchell declared that the Secretary of the State, that was Madison, had a wife to aid him in his pretensions. And because of that advantage, Mr. M is going greatly ahead of him. Pinckney himself was refuted to have late, uh, later observed when he lost the election that he was, quote, I was beaten by Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance had I faced Mr. Madison alone. Although she had her critics, some of whom considered her both a political meddler and too ostentatiously reminiscent of European queens, Dolly's welcoming demeanor and French-inspired fashion style made her popular with many Americans who longed for more elegance in their first lady. Certainly, this often sparkly and courtly clothing she donned on social occasions conveyed the importance of her privileged position to the public. 
At the time, writer Margaret Bayard Smith noted admiringly that at Madison's first inauguration ball, Dolly, quote, looked like a queen, one who exuded dignity and grace. Smith further maintained that, quote, it would be absolutely impossible for anyone to behave with more perfect propriety than she did. It seems to me that such manners would disarm envy itself and conciliate even enemies. Dolly was able to combine the talents of Martha as a highly congenial hostess with Abigail's keen understanding of politics, fusing both those threads to excel as a social and political force on behalf of her husband. Far more than the male politicians of her day, Dolly understood the central importance of compromise, accommodation, and the need to build consensus in a Republican form of government, something probably we would, could uh, use sorely today. Dolly became a celebrity in her own day, viewed as a heroine for rescuing Washington's portrait just before the British set fire to the White House. In essence, Dolly became the nation's symbolic cheerleader during the war, raising public morale with her positive attitude. And even after President Madison died, when Dolly later moved back to Washington, she remained an influential figure and in to entertain politicians who sought her advice. I believe she actually knew eight presidents personally during her lifetime. Dolly Madison was only a child in 1776. She may have understood that it was the beginning of a momentous new era, but she could not have imagined to what extent the revolution would change her world and the lives of future generations of men and women throughout America. All first three ladies witnessed cataclysmic changes during their lifetimes. While some of the founders' outlooks on what constituted appropriate women's roles may offend our modern ears, we really need to examine their stories in the context of their times. Their experiences focus a lens on the development of the role of presidential first lady, as it would become known over time, as well as evolving views on women's place and marriage. During the presidential years, and indeed throughout their marriages, each of the three political presidential wives developed robust skills as a political spouse, operating as part of a tight family union of their own. Perhaps Abigail's daughter, Nabby Adams, summed it up best when in 1788, she wrote to her brother, John Quincy, the happiness of our family seems to have been so interwoven with the politics of our country as to be in a great degree dependent on them. The involvement of Martha, Abigail, and Dolly in the public sphere stemmed from their attachments as the wives of the most prominent political players in the United States, but that does not diminish the importance of their own contributions. Certainly, all three first ladies used their socio-political positions to advance the interests of their families, and through their elite place in society, they helped perpetuate a class of national political leaders. Abigail Adam, Adams was not only the mother of a future American president, but politics permeated their family discourse. And a number of both the Madisons and Washington's close relatives were either elected politicians or otherwise prominent in political circles. The experience of our nation's original first ladies demonstrate that the public world of men and the domestic women, the domestic world of women of their era often intersected. They capably managed their complicated households and carried out the normal duties of women of their status, dealt with heartbreaking personal losses of their children and other close relatives and so many life-threatening illnesses. And at the same time, they engaged in the politics of of their era. They, um, when George and Martha Washington, John and Abigail Adams, and James and Dolly Madison were born, the American colonies were an integral part of the far-flung British Empire. 
and by the mid 1700s and even on the age of, uh, on the eve of the revolution america had been had really become more british than ever before all three originally considered so, themselves english by birth culture and social orientation and they were united by their allegiance to the crown but from the beginning of their husband's presidency Martha, Abigail, and, Dem and Dolly demonstrated their deep commitment to the principles of independence and liberty, which had first emerged in the revolution in revolutionary America. Um, the prominent political families of our modern times, such as the Kennedys, Roosevelt's, Bushes, and Clintons, are not a new phenomenon. Family political influence took root at the dawn of our national history. And the story of our initial first ladies provides insight into the nature of political power in the United States, both at its center and at the, at the margins. In each of their own ways, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison succeeded in putting her own distinct stamp on her role of first lady. That complicated position, pioneered by the trio, often served as a lightning rod for real influence, as well as controversy, a phenomenon that endures to our day. So I thank you for joining me, and I'm happy to answer questions if Mina is willing to moderate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A, as I mentioned, um, and I will moderate them at this time. Uh, but first, I have to say, I'm so curious about how those three men met those three women and decided that they were going to marry because they just seemed so perfect for the times, given what they were going to experience in, you know, in the politics and the families and stuff. I okay. just, a, a little aside. <laughs> okay, so that's um, complicated. And that's a whole other story. But um, okay. George Washington um, courted Martha. Apparently, they had met at some social function in Virginia earlier. Um, I have to say, I think Martha was very charming, and we we don't really have pictures of her painting. Um, I, I understand she was quite attractive, but maybe what was most attractive was she was probably the wealthiest um, widow in Virginia at the time. And this was a second marriage. She had four children from her first marriage. Her husband and two children died among the very um, frequent epidemics. Um, and George, she and George never had biological children of their own, but he um, was very fond of both children and felt he would guide them. Um, both those children died um, before their parents. So very sad. They did have a number of grandchildren, which they raised. So that's their story. Abigail and John met when I believe she was 14 um, and he came to visit their house and it took a while, um, especially to convince her parents that they, they didn't marry. I think she was 19 or 20 um, for quite a while. But um, uh, Abigail's parents um, were elite. Um, at that time, ministers were considered at the height of society. And, her, and Abigail's mother came from a prominent political family. And John came from a, just a very middle-class, low-farming um, background. So um, they felt that Abigail had uh, married beneath her. But um, I really feel if you, if you, anyone has a chance, and I, I quote a lot of them in the book, if you have a chance to read their correspondence, I really think they were soulmates. Um, they were intellectual equals, and they supported one another um, their, you know, entire lives. And then Dolly, again, uh, um, there's where the major um, early American epidemics come to play. Her, her first husband died in a, the famous um, 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. About 10% of the population perished. And um, I believe um, another politician boarded at um, Dolly's mother's boarding house, and um, that's how she was fixed up with James Madison. Wow. It's like Tinder for the 1700s. Yeah. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions. Patricia says, Abigail Adams was strongly anti-slavery. How did this influence or impact her relationships with Martha and Dolly, who were in favor of slavery and dependent on enslaved people for their income and lifestyle? Yeah, yeah that's, I sadly have to say that I never found anything positive in terms of slavery um, and their views from either Martha or 
um, Dally. Um, Abigail, um, I mean, she knew of, um, uh, uh, certainly knew the Adamses. And um, when John was in Philadelphia, he dined several times at um, the Madison house. But that, uh, Abigail didn't have much direct connection with Dolly other than asking, I think, for a job for one of her nephews later down the road. But she was very close with Martha. And um, before um, they left, um, after the, uh, the defeat of, of uh, John Adams, she did stop at the plantation, um, Martha's plantation, and she, she was horrified by slavery. Both, as you mentioned, both John and Abigail were very strongly anti-slavery. Their son, John Quincy, was even a stronger um, proponent. Um, but, um, you know, this was a what shall I say, kind of a dark part of politics. I think that the slavery issue was overlooked um, at the beginning of the Republic because of the friction that it would have caused. And so even in the in the peace treaty um, at the end of the war, and John Adams was integral in um, executing that peace treaty, they skipped over, for instance, um, the slavery issue altogether and many... Um, a number of black slaves had actually fled to to um, England where they were promised um, freedom. So Abigail did write after that, but it didn't seem to interfere with their um, friendship along the way. And and um, they understood that the Southern Bloc was very integral to the success of the, the nation. So they, they overlooked that. Um, but John um, said on many, many occasions, he was very proud of the fact that he never even contemplated owning in quotes another human being mm -hmm. so just uh not john quincy is john adams and abigail adams's son right okay um eva jane asks for martha what particular sources did you use to flesh out the real person and how she approached her role to the first lady as being the first first lady right um, Martha unfortunately burned a lot of the letters um, uh, after Washington died, but there are enough um, that have survived to, to give you um, insight into her. And she she's much more well read than we you know expected. She read newspapers and magazines when she was uh, first lady um, all the time. Um, and the letter, you can see in the letters we have how connected she was with her family, how illness, how much illness um, played a part in her life. Um, you have to admire whatever you think about her political views or her, her views about slavery. Such great losses. How did she go on and keep going when she lost all four of her children? And she wrote one of her nieces when a friend's child died. She said, well, you know, Americans know that um, if you have a lot of children, um, you're bound to lose many of them along the way. So um, we do get, and, and there are a couple of letters that survive um, with, with um, and more from him uh, to her. But it's it's very clear that she felt very protective of her husband. She has a we get some good insights of what she felt like to be um, the wife of the president. You know when she called it a state uh, prisoner, and that's not so unusual. Um, uh, Harry Truman um, wrote when he was uh, at one point to someone that um, he saw the White House as the great white prison. So um, being in the public eye in the fishbowl um, has to be exceedingly challenging, even if you love the political power and the hope, hopefully, that we hope that many of them want to be doing something good. Do we know why she burnt all of so many of his papers? Um, we, we don't, other than um, very, very private person, and um, assumedly there were some love letters in there as well. Um, and remember, she didn't have her, no, I mean, she had grandchildren, but no surviving children. Very sad that, uh, you know, uh, all four of her children predeceased her. Yeah. Um, Kathleen asks, for the earliest years of First Ladies, did there start to be annual events at the White House, such as the holiday events? I know you had mentioned something yeah, about- Yeah, the holiday event, actually, I think Abigail Adams is the first one that has a, a New Year's event. So yes, and don't forget, they weren't really um, 
uh, Abigail was in what was the, um, what shall I call it, the nascent structure of what would become the White House, where, you know, she famously hung her, her laundry in the East Room. So um, Washington was pretty bare bones at the time um, when she was there. But yes, I think she she did certainly um, start that tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, Teresa and several people in the chat have said this is very, it's wonderful talk. They're very eye-opening. Um, Carol says, how did term first lady develop? The term lady sort of reflects royalty. Right. Well, I wouldn't say royalty. I think it was, uh, you know, consciously not queen um, or king. Mm -hmm. It evolved over time and we don't think it was actually used popularly maybe even as far as um, Mrs. Lincoln. Um, there were, uh, you know, it was the president's wife was commonly, um, uh, uh, Abigail was sometimes referred to as the presidentess. Um, so, and uh, Martha was almost always called Lady Washington. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Eva Jane asks, of the three women, which became your favorite? Oh, Abigail, because if you follow my trajectory, um, I started, uh, I, I think of um, my three American history books, and I have others in other areas, as a trilogy. So Revolutionary Medicine is about the Washingtons, um, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, a little bit on the Madisons and a lot on the Adamses, um, and how um, the, the presidents, the early presidents, intersected with health and how it reflected 18th century medicine. Then I became very um, focused on the three ladies when I was doing that. So um, then I did the second book, of course, was the, the the first three ladies. Then Abigail was clearly my favorite. So my most recent book is about specifically about the years John and Abigail spent in Europe. And again, I mean, fabulous letters. Um, the, I, I've seldom seen more articulate writers than the two of them. And they both had kind of sly, subtle senses of humor. So you get a lot of, there's a lot of satire. So you'll you'll get that when you read their letters. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they all, each couple had its own characteristics or personality. Um, you know, I mean, like you said, the was it them that you said that had like the great love story that they were life- you know. I I, th I think of them as soulmates. You know, every um uh I think the letters all start my dearest friend. You know, so not just spouses but friends. And you have to give um you know Ad John Adams is sometimes portrayed as this kind of crotchety you know uh, <laughs> gruff man. Um, he was exceedingly loving in terms of um Abigail. Not that they never argued or anything, but um. Uh, I, I I think in their case, it was a love match and it was an intellectual match. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I want to say that the book about Abigail and uh, John Adams in Europe was published in 2021. So it is out there. All of your books can be found at the library. Um, so, and on Amazon. <laughs> and on Amazon and at Indian Arts. stores. So make sure you uh, check into them. But what is up next for you, Jeannie? Well, I am retiring from my job in uh, my, my, I have 42 years as, at the University of Denver next January. So um, I have a couple of things in the works and I actually just completed a draft uh, just yesterday on a review of um, a new book by uh, Simon Shama on vaccines and um, discoveries, particularly cholera, bubonic plague. So I'm keeping a hand in it, but I have some Things that have been put on the burner. I was a history major, but an art minor. So I am hoping to enroll in courses at the Denver Botanic Gardens in oh. botanic illustration mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, keep a hand in it. Excellent. Well, we'll hope that we can hang out with you again at some point when uh, when you're retired and you have plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, and I see someone would like my email. I'm um, uh, Mina can share that. I'm happy to talk to you virtually um, anytime. Okay. Um, so Jeannie, thank you so much for doing this. I know that we've been planning this for a while and you have also been super patient with the technology. I and But the facts and the figures and the, the stories, you just, you just made it come alive. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. You can see, I, uh, you know, they're, they're not without flaws as no humans are without flaws, but there's a lot to admire in those first three ladies.
Absolutely. And it's nice to get that perspective uh, because we do hear about the presidents, but not enough about how their wives supported them through, as you said, they were people of their time. So it's very different than like now where maybe they can be more supportive. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's a talk for another day, but yeah. thanks everybody for being here, Jeannie. Thank you again. Pleasure. And I thank you, Mina, again, for all your help and nice to meet all of you virtually. Yep. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.